For as long as mankind has existed, so too has fear. It takes many shapes and sizes, and what fear is may differ from person to person. Maybe it's the fear of the depths of the ocean. Maybe it's the fear of arachnid arthropods. The fear of circus entertainers. Or a fear of what we don't understand. It doesn't matter who or what you are, we all, as humans, call this emotion fear. It used to be that fear would be avoided at all costs. Fear would be straight away from. But in the 20th century, with the popularization of major motion pictures, it all changed. The birth of the horror movie genre introduced us to a bizarre world of inhuman serial killers born out of malice or hatred, supernatural evils beyond our corporeal dimension, and the disturbing depths of the human psyche itself. With the birth of the slasher subgenre in the form of Halloween, Friday the 13th, and A Nightmare on Elm Street, horror icons such as Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees, and Freddy Krueger were given life on the big screen. For a long time, horror was nearly completely based around supernatural slashers wielding large blades, slicing up however many innocents they could before finally being dealt the final blow, only to stand right up and walk into the sequel. All that changed with the release of the film The Blair Witch Project. While technically not the first of its genre, Cannibal Holocaust takes this title, The Blair Witch Project propelled the found footage horror genre into the mainstream, shot on a budget of $35,000 and crushing it with a whopping $248 million at the box office. The found footage subgenre would see many popular films be born out of it, such as Paranormal Activity, The Poughkeepsie Tapes, and As Above So Below. But just like any genre that becomes profitable, it became oversaturated, with tropes becoming abundant and reliant on jump scares. Horror films were, yet again, in danger of becoming stale. Enter the internet. A wild west of sorts for all sorts of media to exist. In the early 2000s, horror stories would be created, copied, and pasted throughout the web, thus creating the creepypasta. Creepypastas would enjoy a long lifespan on the internet, over 20 years before they became formulaic, cliché, and all around boring. Coinciding with the creation of creepypastas were alternate reality games, or ARGs, and the two mediums would sometimes intertwine, the most famous example being Marble Hornets, an ARG centering around Slenderman, arguably the most well-known creepypasta of all time. In 2009, a short British web series was created called No Through Road, inspired by the Blair Witch Project, The Strangers, and the Bunny Man urban legend originating in 1979 in Clifton, Virginia. This work of media is known commonly as the first of an offshoot of found footage horror that came to be known as analog horror. No Through Road and Marble Hornets may have created the genre, but it wouldn't begin to gain traction until the release of the series Local 58 in 2015 by Chris Straub, who is also known for the creation of the creepypasta Candle Cove. While the genre started in the late 2000s to early 2010s, it wouldn't become named until 2015 by Local 58, with the slogan, Analog Horror at 476 MHz. With a new name and a new forerunner, Analog Horror had officially begun. Analog horror is defined by its low-quality VHS-era graphics, constant video and audio glitches, and often cutting to subliminal messaging. Subscribe to Unibus if you would like more content like this in the future. Electronics, including televisions and VHS camcorders. Much of analog horror is inspired by the 1998 Japanese film Ring, more commonly known by the 2002 American remake The Ring. Analog horror can be described as the spiritual successor to creepypastas, as they mostly follow similar themes of manipulation and tampering of analog devices, such as game consoles, in the case of creepypastas, and televisions, in the case of both analog horror and creepypastas. In July 2019, four years after being christened, due to the creation of the Five Nights at Freddy's VHS tape series created by Squimpus McGrimpus, analog horror was propelled into internet stardom. Five Nights at Freddy's needs no introduction, but I'll introduce it anyway. Five Nights at Freddy's is a horror franchise created by Scott Cawthon in 2014, which took the internet by storm for years to come. Was that the Spawning nine sequels, a book and comic series, and more recently, a film produced by Blumhouse. Where to? The franchise is set mainly in the late 1900s, ranging anywhere from the 1970s to the 1990s, setting it perfectly in the middle of the VHS era. Squimpus McGrimpus' series skyrocketed in popularity due to the combination of the dark lore of the franchise with the low quality and sometimes disturbing imagery associated with analog horror, causing interest in the genre to skyrocket and, only a few months later, solidify itself as an official subgenre of horror. 
Marble Hornets, Local 58, and Squimpus's FNAF tapes had monopolized Analog Horror for nearly a combined decade before a contender was thrown into the ring. Created by Remy Abode in November 2019, Gemini Home Entertainment came to being, inspired heavily by Local 58. Gemini Home Entertainment is an anthology series told through different educational programs on the network Gemini Home Entertainment, all of which intertwine to tell a story. The basic rundown of the story is a massive sentient exoplanet named the Iris, which is a living being, moves into the solar system and sends down creatures called wood crawlers into Earth, slowly morphing Earth from within into an eldritch horror straight from the pages of Lovecraft. While the story is much more nuanced and implied than what I've described, being told in both the series and a tie-in video game, that is the basic rundown of the story. Gemini Home Entertainment is an achievement in internet creativity, showing what someone can make with limited resources and an idea. The problem with Gemini Home Entertainment is that it would be the earliest known example of analog horror to feature a trend of the genre that would eventually be its undoing. In April 2020, a new analog horror series had taken everyone by surprise in its creativity, level of depth in its storytelling, and the new take on its inspiration. Once again inspired by Five Nights at Freddy's, The Walton Files follows the story of a fictional animatronic-themed diner named Bond's Burgers, which closed down due to a series of unfortunate events, <coughs> and the co-founder's family, Jack Walton, meeting their unfortunate fates at the hands of Jack's trusted friend, Felix Kranken. Only one member of the family survives, Sophie Walton. The Walton Files takes its inspiration from Five Nights at Freddy's in stride, turning the story we've been piecing together for nine years now, keeping the core plot points such as dead bodies stuffed in animatronics and as a result being possessed, shady companies well underpaying their employees for life-threatening work, and the main man behind it all, orchestrating it from the very beginning, all to achieve a goal, and turning it into a horrifically disturbing series. It's a dark series full of trauma, death, and grief, and when I first watched it two years ago, alone in my dark room at well past midnight, I was genuinely disturbed by the places the series went and the designs of the animatronics, incredibly impressive for something done on a smartphone. And only one year later, another series, this time in the same vein as Gemini Home Entertainment, would come to light, making The Walton Files, Gemini, and Local 58 pale in comparison. We are currently receiving countless reports of unidentified hostile organisms that we'll refer to as alternates. These are the famous first lines of the Mandela Catalog Volume 1, one of the most well-known analog horror series on the internet. Created by Alex Kister in June of 2021, the Mandela Catalog takes place in my beautiful home state of Wisconsin in the fictional Mandela County. Alex himself is also a fellow cheesehead, so that's pretty cool. Anyway, the Mandela Catalog began with the video Overthrown, created for a contest on the Analog Horror subreddit. In turn, however, Overthrown began one of the most unique analog horror series to date. The story begins in biblical times, at the construction of Noah's Ark. When the Ark was built, just like the story, it was filled to the brim with every species on the planet. And something else. The Alternates. Demonic entities capable of shifting form to look near identical to humans, the alternates wouldn't make their presence known until thousands of years later, in the 1970s and 80s. In 1981, the alternate threat became so grave that the United States Department of Temporal Phenomenon was founded to counteract them, creating informational tapes to try and inform the public on how to approach an alternate encounter. Or were they? During the Mandela Catalog Volume 1, during the 911 dispatcher section of the video, there's only three types of emergencies listed before a fourth appears, titled Encounter. 
The police are told explicitly to not assist those encountering alternates, no matter how much they're suffering. They're told to lie and tell the caller that help is on the way. And they're also told not to speak too much as to not show their fear. Everything we know about the validity of the Department of Temporal Phenomenon is thrown into question due to this statement. Can we trust any video that comes out afterwards? Who can we trust? Is every video a subliminal message in disguise, or is there a good Samaritan fighting against the demonic takeover of Mandela County? These questions propel the series forward, eventually moving into the 2000s where, in their alternate reality, <laughs> Technology and devices with screens have been outlawed due to certain alternate variants only becoming corporeal through such mediums. While Gemini Home Entertainment created the baseline for the imposter humans, the Mandela Catalog perfected it. The reason the Mandela Catalog was so scarily effective was the utilization of the Uncanny Valley, a natural phenomenon where, the more human something clearly not human appears, the more unnerving it becomes. This same phenomenon is actually what caused Five Nights at Freddy's to also skyrocket into popularity. It's also why this is so scary. Are you scared yet? This response is theorized to have been developed to keep our ancestors from catching diseases from corpses, while some like to entertain the notion that such a response was developed because at one point in human history, we lived side by side with a being that looked human but wasn't. On a side note, this theory does hold some weight as we did once share the planet with Neanderthals before driving them to extinction. Moving on, the Mandela Catalog is still going to this day, with the latest video being released on October 13th, 2023, over two years after its initial debut. The Mandela Catalog became to modern analog horror what Gemini Home Entertainment and Local 58 had been to the Mandela Catalog, inspiration. But with so many being inspired at the same time, arose a problem. The Long-Eyed Project, The Smile Tapes, Vita Carnis, Basswood County, all of these analog horror projects released after the success of the Mandela Catalog and it's beginning to show. The Mandela Catalog began a trend in analog horror that some people categorized by the quote, Germa face, unquote, named after a meme of a photoshopped picture of streamer Germa985, so for this video I'll refer to it as Germa Syndrome. In analog horror, Germa Syndrome is identified by black and white, spooky, photoshopped images of normal looking people suddenly gaining wide smiles or gaping maws, sometimes alongside unnerving eyes that are meant to trigger human fight or flight responses. These analog eyes, as they've come to be known as, appear everywhere in analog horror, and while it wasn't wholly unique to the Mandela catalog, much like lots of other things in analog horror, it did popularize it. Some gems did pop up in this post-Mandela era, including Vita Carnis, the Macabre Experiments, and the Monument Mythos, though sometimes they also suffer from these cliches. And so, much like the creepypastas that came before them, analog horror became stale, bland, cookie cutter, and worst of all, not scary. Analog horror ended up becoming so formulaic that people would create meme versions of analog horror just to prove how easy it was to replicate. People even created bingo cards based on what cliches have appeared and will continue to appear as the genre continues with no innovation. While some do try new things such as Vita Carnis's Trimming Care Guide or the Monument Mythos's Living Monuments, they still suffer from a handful of these tropes. At some point during the oversaturation of analog horror, Kane Pixels, known famously for his historical Attack on Titan footage, began releasing an analog horror series based on the backrooms, a concept created on 4chan claiming that if you were to clip out of reality, you'd be trapped there forever in a maze of liminal hallways. In early 2022, Kane Pixels created his own take on the backrooms, adding an entity that would follow you through the backrooms, and the internet ran with it, creating levels, lore, entities, ways to escape, and a corporation studying the backrooms. The problem with this was that the backrooms were always meant to be a mystery, an enigmatic, endless series of hallways outside the bounds of reality, which you can never escape from. This concept alone was terrifying, but when people began creating lore around it, they butchered it. As the saying goes, less is more. And so, analog horror fell into a stalemate. Nobody was creating anything new, and those that did had to be truly unique in order to shine amongst the sea of mediocrity that festered in the wake of the Mandela Catalog. It seemed that nobody wanted to create new ideas. In November 2022, artist Urban Spook began uploading videos in a series called The Painter, which centered around a serial killer, later revealed to be two serial killers, who would murder people and afterwards create paintings of their corpses. The story is told through police reports investigating the murders. The series was initially praised for its groundedness in artwork, as it wasn't based on haunted animatronics or demons or aliens invading from unknown locations, but it was set here, in our real world, 
where things like this do happen. The painter began with a video named Faces, which halfway through showed paintings created by the serial killer, named the wax doll Tom, Lisa's secret face, hanging Jimmy, f toy Cory, Daniel after the fire, Jennifer's last stare, and scream Maggie scream. The series' main horror aspect came from the brutality of the murders, including stab wounds to the genital regions and the unsettling and disturbing nature the paintings featured. Many people praised Urban Spook for his new take on analog horror, and as a result, the series began to spread on social media. Urban Spook gained a lot of support from his first two videos, until the release of In the Walls. In the Walls follows the disappearances and eventual recoveries of two children, Corey and Margaret Beck. When the bodies of Corey and Margaret are found, both of them have been cut in half, with Corey's lower half and Margaret's top half being sewn together, and a brick shoved down Margaret's throat with the word meat written on it. If it's not obvious at this point, Corey Beck is the person that the painting F*** Toy Corey depicts, and the insinuation is that Corey was raped before his death and subsequent mutilation. The reveal of Corey being 11 years old caused a lot of controversy around Urban Spook, with many realizing that the story has no actual substance and is simply shock value for shock value. As the series progressed, Urban Spook would try to mend this belief by creating the twist that all along there had been two serial killers, but this didn't change the bitter taste in people's mouth regarding the painting of the 11 year old named F*** Toy Corey, which, by the way, Urban Spook sells as a t-shirt. For any of you weird enough to want to wear a t-shirt of a mutilated, sexually assaulted young boy? The fleeting praise for Urban Spook had flown off, leaving it floating just below the water. Analog horror as a genre has quite the history behind it, with many notable series being born out of it. As of recently, analog horror has been brought back to the public eye due to the series Greylock, and while it does have novel ideas, it still suffers from certain cliches that plague analog horror. Even with brand new videos and series coming out hoping to reinvent the genre, they still fall into the same pitfalls that the others have fallen into. Does this mean that the analog horror genre is truly dead? No, but it has grown stale and formulaic. So what is analog horror if not dead, but also not innovative anymore? Analog horror is exactly like those that came before it. Slasher horror, found footage, and creepypastas. An innovative idea that took everyone by surprise in its level of disturbing content, but over time grew tiresome and was not growing as a genre at the same speed as it was in popularity. As a fan of analog horror, I'll still be on the lookout for the next big thing. I'll still be watching the next VHS-themed series about demons or aliens or monsters that try to look human, governments or companies trying to sweep things under the rug and lull the population into a false sense of security, the one person amongst the bunch that sees through the lies and tries to help people before it's too late. But just because I'm gonna watch it, it doesn't mean that the problems in the genre all of a sudden don't exist. Just because Greylock has done rounds in the horror community doesn't mean it's breaking new ground. Just because Vita Carnis shed light on its monsters doesn't mean they still don't borrow from the Mandela Catalog's alternates to an extent. The genre is becoming stale, and if it doesn't change soon, another form of it will take its place, and analog horror will join its predecessors. Wait, 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 no, 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 no!